It is my great privilege to welcome all of you to the, the Archdiocese of Washington for our 13th National Black Catholic Congress. For some of us of a certain age, this is our second Congress in our nation's capital. We first gathered not far from here at the Catholic University of America in 1987, filled with the same enthusiasm, hope, and optimism with which we now convene some three and a half decades later this year. Since then, we have witnessed many historic changes and monumental struggles in our church and in our world. We have come a great way, but we have so much farther to go. And so here we are, Lord. We are members of a proud Catholic family of enduring, unshakable faith. And this gathering always feels, feels something like a family reunion. We may not see each other as often as we would love to, but we seem to pick up right where we left off the last time we were together. In a special way, I greet all of my brother deacons, priests, bishops, women and men in consecrated life, and other distinguished guests who have made it a priority to be with us. The Archdiocese of Washington is blessed to host this powerful renewal of heart, spirit, and mind, even as we also set aside a little time to renew relationships with those we may, have, we may not have seen for a few years, and to build new ones with those with whom we have not yet had the pleasure to meet. Welcome, all of you. May our time together bear great fruit, and may our Heavenly Father shower his graces upon all of us. The theme for our 13th National Black Catholic Congress is an invitation, really, a challenge extended to each of us to write the vision, the prophetic call to thrive. These next few days will provide plenty of opportunities to reflect on this theme and to grow in faith, wisdom, and in courage. To what do we hear Christ calling us and how will we live that out? What is the vision we have for our homes, our communities, our parishes, and our church? And is it, at all, is it all that it should be? Are we asking enough of ourselves in his name? Will we find his favor in the way that we live our lives? As if the daily headlines incess incessantly announce unspeakable acts of violence and racism in our neighborhoods, workplaces, and schools aren't enough to weigh us down. For too long, the pandemic prevented us from even being able to gather in fellowship. Our news feeds and social media barrage us with instantaneous illustrated accounts of events that break our hearts. We no longer have to wait for the evening broadcast news. The bad news follows and finds us wherever we are. If ever we needed the healing and the peace that only Christ himself can offer. But there are just as many positives, moments of hope, of accomplishment, of progress that enliven us and affirm that if we place our trust squarely in our Heavenly Father, He will sustain us and provide the means to overcome our burdens so that we may continue to be Christ's hands and feet in a world that doesn't always seem to realize how very urgently it needs Him. For clarity in this vision, we are called to write, 
we turn as always to scripture, which tells us to walk and not faint. It admonishes us not to grow weary or tired. We experience all manner of troubles in our lives, in our jobs, in our families, our finances, unfortunately, even within our church. We should not have we shouldn't have to be reminded, but sometimes we all do, to place our confidence in the one who never leaves us, who helps us to weather the storms that may otherwise claim us figuratively, if not literally. God's finely focused vision for us, which seeks beyond, which sees beyond whatever obstacles loom before us, must become our vision for one another. Every moment in history challenges us to discern with new eyes how we are living. Do our words and actions reflect our faith? Are we witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ in profound and prophetic ways? For guidance, I suggest that we need only to look at the courageous black Catholics who have gone before us. The six holy souls currently under scrutiny in the process of canonization in Rome serve as sources of great pride and inspiration for black Catholics, indeed for all Catholics. These six courageous people for us with prayer, perseverance, acceptance of the divine gift of the Eucharist assure us that we shall not perish. We have hope. Prayer, especially our prayer at the Lord's table during the celebration of the Eucharist is our foundation. The Eucharist strengthens us, soothes us, and heals us so that we may build lives that radiate the love, the care, and the peace that we so desperately need and desire. This, my friends, in Christ is how we will thrive. It is why we will thrive. We know all too well that no vision can be realized without God's hand guiding our steps and without our constant reliance on the Eucharist. At this moment in our church's history, Pope Francis has given us a path to discern how we should live and thrive through synodality, a new word for an old and time-tested concept. We have been journeying with the Holy Father throughout our parishes and dioceses all over the world. We have participated in listening sessions and conversations to discuss how we are flourishing and how we are struggling as Catholics. We have actively engaged in discussions about the ways that we are prophetically called to respond better to our brothers and sisters in the church and as church. There is always more room for improvement than we must be, that we must be prepared to admit. However, it is in naming and facing these truths that we draw closer to the heart of Christ. Just as Pope Francis has set the entire global church on a synodal path of listening, dialogue, participation, and mission. Here in the United States, we have also undertaken a national Eucharistic revival that will culminate with a gathering in Indianapolis, Indiana, exactly a year from now. These are new and innovative ways to place us in renewed relationships growing in holiness, even as we grow deeper in our love for Christ Jesus. 
We write our vision to thrive with each act of love, every word of encouragement we offer, and every demonstration of respect for the dignity of another person is a sign of holiness. With every grace we gratefully experience from God, we are one step closer to realizing the unfolding vision established in each of us at the time of our baptism. We can only hope to thrive because of God's mercy and goodness, and both are offered freely and in abundance. We have all witnessed this action in our lives. We are living, breathing testaments of how much God loves us. We have overcome generations of anguish, suffering, and injustice. We have kept the faith, even when many could not understand why or how we have kept the faith. We stand tall on the shoulders of those who have gone before us, teaching us priceless lessons of perseverance and dedication. Our vision must include transmitting that same help and hope to those who will follow us. Bishop Stive and I had an opportunity last evening to spend some time with a few of our young people, and we were deeply gratified to know that we are leaving the church in such good and caring and competent hands of our young folks. Don't be fooled by the notion that our youth are, our, are the future, the church of tomorrow. Indeed, they are the energetic, thoughtful, passionate church of the now. I dare say we have so much to learn from these young people as they have to learn from us. I listened as they shared their hopes, their dreams, and their concerns, and I was renewed. I heard their sincere desire to be more involved in service and in leadership. They long for the love of Jesus Christ, and they want to share this great gift they have found with every other soul that they encounter. They are disciples. We owe it to them to be the finest examples that we can be. They are relying on us. I already know we can count on them. As we search our hearts for understanding, we must do what every generation before us has done. We must anchor ourselves in the Eucharist. It is impossible to listen to Christ's voice if we do not carefully and consciously pause the busyness of our daily lives. The beauty of the liturgy, especially the vibrancy of our black Catholic celebrations, draw all of us into an encounter with Jesus Christ that expresses our heartfelt yearning for God's presence. We know he always walks with us during the good times, of course, but also in those challenging moments that test our resolve. The wonderful Sister Thea Bowman told the U.S. bishops, and I was there and heard firsthand as did Bishop Stibe, and I don't know whoever else as old as I am. <laughs> Sister Thea said, I bring myself, my black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that hope that I hope to become. In our black Catholic experience within the sacred liturgy, we must bring our whole selves to participate in the powerful prayer of thanksgiving. Our music conveys both our joy and the heaviness that lingers in our hearts. We sometimes sit in blessed silence and adoration and prayerful meditation 
before the blessed sacrament. It is also in the sacred moment of the Eucharistic prayer when we gaze upon the body of Christ, the source and summit of our lives and our unity, that we are made fully aware of a humanity that needs Jesus to endure all things and live more fully. When we imitate Christ's perfect example of how to love our neighbor as ourselves, we become witnesses of Christ Jesus in a hurting world. We are a people of prayer, encountering Christ in the Eucharist. We depend upon the bread of life who has come to us in love so that we may encourage others and love them as Christ loves them. With our devotion to the Eucharist at the center of all that we do, each of us is called to become an image of Christ in an injured world that cries out for relief, relief that can only be found in God himself. Christ in the Eucharist is the real presence of what we most seek in our lives. It is in the receiving of Christ in the Eucharist that we are transformed. The Eucharist gives us the energy and the impetus to continue to strive for justice. The Eucharist nourishes us and sustains us so that we can engage in dialogue with those who disagree with us by modeling Christ's patience and his love. The Eucharist strengthens us to serve our families and communities with a spirit of generosity and respect for life at every stage, from the womb until the final days of our earthly journey. The Eucharist unites us to live courageously and with unending hope that through prayer, planning, and hard work, we will indeed thrive. From our inadequate van human vantage point, we can't begin to see on our own any comprehensive vision for our lives. We must first look to our Heavenly Father and lean on the guidance of God's Holy Spirit to open our hearts, minds, and eyes to the Lord's vision for us. Our hearts are grateful for the grace the living Christ grants us. We mustn't let ourselves be disconnected from our Heavenly Father by the distractions of the day. Our faith must not be dampened by the sheer heartlessness of people that so often seem to surround and confront us. Ours is not to lean on our own understanding, but instead on the understanding that only comes from the Lord. Our prophetic call to love is found in the Eucharist. We must bring Christ's healing presence to a world that too often only pulses with despair. We are called in the Eucharist to be Christ's light in spaces of overwhelming worldly darkness. As we set about the important work of writing our vision and responding to the prophetic call to thrive in love and service, the Eucharist is our unifying reminder that we belong to one another and are truly entirely interdependent. God created our human hearts to love, to care, and to support our brothers and sisters. And that is how we will thrive. For we are members of one proud Catholic family of enduring, unshakable faith. And that's what families do. May God be praised, glorified, and blessed always. And may you know his closeness and the prophetic call in your life, today and every day of your tomorrow. Amen. <laughs>